And so that leap of faith is a major part of the response that God consistently desires of believers. That isn't anything new. Before I get into Psalm 77, and you may want to start turning there right now, that's where we're going to head, I'd like to give you some general ideas about the Psalms themselves. How were the Psalms used in ancient Israel? Well, they involve one who knows the way, guiding other people, like the teacher of the small children. Worshippers in those days would come with faulty starting points or with something they needed to have reinforced in the right way. They very typically would come without feeling they were required by God to risk anything because that's really tough. They came, in other words, without the perspectives that God wanted them to have. In Psalm 77, the appeal of, Psalm, of that psalm comes despite unchanged, threatening circumstances. Because their life, even though they're sitting in this whatever assembly allows them to hear the psalm and to experience it, their life is still hurting fiercely and it would continue to do that. The worship leaders very carefully had under the guidance of the Holy Spirit, crafted a participatory event. And as I read the Psalms, I'm more and more convinced that these Psalms require an audience to participate if they're going to be really meaningful. They had crafted this participatory event to expose the errors in thinking that were keeping everyone bound by fright and by anger. And then, from that starting point, they would lead anyone who was willing to follow God's logic toward God. Those who are sharing the Psalms experience participate in expressing the Psalm. So as a result, they did something that you and I don't typically do. They needed it, it was a, an oral culture. They didn't have any books, they couldn't go back to those books. So many people who came to worship planned to come and to memorize what happened in front of them and around them. And once they did that, of course, they could then carry that back so it wasn't a one-shot deal. They could, in their own time, in their own space, have replays on demand. Their memory would let them do that. And then they could either use the advantage of those memories or they could share it with someone else. The Psalms and the presentations were crafted so that that portability, usefulness, actually happened. The authors of various Psalms lead participants then and now away from the wrong beginning points, wrong thinking, wrong conclusions, and they then implant this into God's truth. They implant God's truth into the people who came. The Psalms helped to identify false premises. You can see how that was, would happen. And then they helped to identify what was a true statement and then install that before God and presumably in a way that would help you to check if you got it right. Let me read for you. I'm starting in the very first verse of Psalm 77. I want to read just that very first verse. I cried out to God for help. I cried out to God to hear me. And that's the verse essentially that Eric shared with us during one of his prayers this morning already. But that verse is what we have come together to call the tint of the psalm. That is, it's what is emphasized in the opening verse that is then carried throughout the rest of the psalm. To understand the rest of the psalm, you have to say, oh, I got it up there, now I'm going to carry it through the whole thing. Psalm 77 
carries worshipers from false assumptions to a valid truth. And in order to do that, on two separate occasions in those two lines, it uses the word cried. That word means to talk, to loudly emit uh, the, an emotionally charged appeal and to keep doing that over time. In fact, let me go a little deeper with that one because I think it's helpful. The Hebrew word for cried means literally to call out for help under great duress. Oh, and they hit it. It is a word that is used throughout the Old Testament. And here I pretty much quote something from one of the resources that I looked up to be able to share this with you this morning. One time, God's response to Moses was for Moses to stop crying and to get into action. And that was really essentially what happened right after the golden calf episode. And Moses was to do something about that instead of just fussing about it to God. But that word also describes the, res the response of Esau to the loss of his blessing. Now, remember what happened in that story of Esau. He and his twin brother, Jacob, had grown up together, of course. And one day, Esau didn't value the idea that God had given a promise to the family and that one of them would be the inheritor of that promise. And he just sold that for a bowl of stew. And after he came to realize what he had lost, what he had traded away in that, he did this crying. It was, I could have been God's instrument for all of history, and I can't do that anymore. And I suspect that's one of the reasons, the bitterness that came out of that is one of the reasons that the descendants of Esau and the descendants of Jacob hate each other. And they, you see examples of that all through, especially the Old Testament, but even King Herod, who tried to get rid of the baby Jesus, was a relative of Esau. He just didn't want anything interfering with the superiority of his people. So that's another place where that word appears. It also refers to a time when Israel lost the ark and they cried. I mean, these are vicious times that we're describing together. It is an emotional complaint that is related to the, world, to the loss of worldly things or advantages. And it very often is used in the scriptures to talk about the enemy is common. We've had a war and everything is ruined and this is how we feel. We cry out. Is a very powerful word. And so all I'm suggesting is you have this powerful word that carries all the way through the rest of Psalm 77. In Psalm 77, we really don't know who's talking, and I don't know that it especially matters. But the best options are either that Psalm 77 is Asaph giving his own autobiographical statement, I'm hurting, or he is is the worship leader. He has tried to craft a statement that would be said by anybody in his congregation. I'm hurting. Either way is possible. It doesn't change the effect on the psalm. But I think it's important to ask that kind of question along the way in this or other psalms because of the way that worshipers were invited to use the psalms. It, it makes sense to me to ask that question. Now, I'm going to do something that's a little different than we've typically done. And that is, that for the next, really, nine verses, I'm going to be taking us through a different translation than you have in front of you. You're welcome, obviously, as I read these, to compare what you see in the NIV, which is probably what most of you have in front of you. I cry aloud to God aloud to God, and he will hear me. So in this particular rendering, that second cry doesn't appear. But what it says, as I try to put myself into being part of saying that, is that worship is hard. 
Worship has to be very deliberate. Worship gains results by a persistent hope that God is going to listen to this when I say it. Because otherwise, I'm just wasting the energy. In other words, worship forces a realistic appeal to God based on the circumstances of your life. And if it's anything different than that, you would, you're trying to play a game with God and you can't recommend it biblically. Verse 2 from the NI, from the uh, English Standard. By the way, everything that it has that blue background is what I'm taking out of the ESV. That, that black background keys that for you. In the day of my trouble, I seek Yahweh. In the night, my hand is stretched out without wearying. My soul refuses to be comforted. That's a tough one, isn't it? This is long-term pain. It is fighting through discouragement. And it often needs extended stages or multiple stages to come to anything that's worthwhile that will actually change your life. In other words, overcoming in the biblical sense is not just making the pain stop right now. It's not even making the pain stop soon. And if you didn't know it, as far as I can tell, these Psalms were written in the middle of the time when the people were in captivity in Babylon, and a lot of the people worshiping would never in their earthly life see anything other than being stuck under the thumb of Babylon. So overcoming has to be something different. What coming to God can produce isn't just tied to making the world the way I want it to be, or even acceptable to me. Overcoming no longer means being under the circumstances. I may face the circumstances, but overcoming means that I'm not under the circumstances. When I remember God, I moan. When I meditate, my spirit faints. And then that word that may or may not be in your NIV, sila. It is in the original Hebrew, however. What I get out of that is the notion that worship is hard. I mean, we've been building to that right along, haven't we? But worship is hard. And coming to God while we're in the middle of pain can very easily evoke inner resistance. God, you're supposed to fix this, all I really want is the world to be made better. Can't you understand that? Why are we dealing with something that's an eternal outcome instead of just fixing my world? And so you're fighting that sort of stuff. Worship is deliberate. But did you see moaning? I don't know how to say that word differently, but I, I hear it very strong. Moaning means that it is an attempt to reach God without words. Believers who are exposed to the emotions of nearing God before the change happens are in a position where they have to develop faith. They have to jump before the bridge has been fully drawn into the picture. And they've already jumped, they've already committed themselves before and, and made it so they can't stop in the middle. Sila is that word that is not in the NIV, but it means to pause. And my sense is that what it means in the Hebrew is that believers, when, it's, when they see that, they would kind of shut down the process of the presentation and the exchange of ideas between the leaders and the congregation. And they would all just pause as everyone absorbs the impact, the oomph of what's going on and the reality of things. It is a make sure you've gotten this much before we go on kind of word. 
You hold my eyelids open. I am so troubled that I cannot speak. Oh, some of us have been to college, and some of us have had exams, and some of us have had to do this. And you know that when that's happening, you're running on engines you don't have and fuel that you don't really have. And you can see that in the way it's said. The Psalm 77 is teaching the refusal to stop praying. It is teaching a determination to reach beyond comfort, even when you're facing those inward obstacles. And it's teaching that you're just forever reaching because there's a God of comfort and it matters if you are reaching to him. This is a very intense personal conversation that says, Yahweh, in the very best form that I know how, I am reporting my heart to you. And again, it's more than I can say in words, but I'm so thankful you kept my moan. You, you interpret moan. God understands and God accepts and honors that level of intensity. If any of us are trying to reach toward God with a blah spirit, Compare this and make your own conclusions about what God is going to honor the most. I consider the days of old, the years long ago. So the worshipers here, even though there isn't a stila to give them time to do it, but they'll go home and they'll carry this whole thing and then they'll be able to do it. Worshipers are able to remember the blessed times because, in fact, in the nation's history, there have been blessed times. But remembering the blessed times in the middle of this hurts right now takes a very deep discipline. Because the current reality that these people were facing is migraine thumping pain. Now, that's a metaphorical statement, obviously. I, I made that up. But it's as though just like the COVID things around us don't ever go away, the Babylonian owning of them, if you will, doesn't ever go away. And it's boom, boom, boom all the time. And here we're seeing a time in worship when worshipers can reach into their biblical history. And God's going to help that in just a moment. You'll see why. Or they can simply reach into their own individual histories and get some of these supporting examples. Yeah, I remember when God took care of me. It's necessary to grab those things because you're going to use those as a springboard to get to something beyond, something that applies right now. I said... Let me remember my song in the night. Let me meditate in my heart. And most of that you get real fast. The idea behind my song would be what I repeat to myself, you know, the psalm that I'm learning. I, I, let me remember this psalm that you're teaching me in 77. Let me, remi let me remember that in the night. And because I repeat it to myself, or maybe repeat it in a family gathering or people who are around me, I reinforce it. I get myself thinking in ways that are going to be help, helpful along the way. I reinforce it as a part of my healing. In, in a very real way, that simple verse says we're starting to get somewhere now. We're taking what we were given in our time back when we were in worship, and now I'm home and I'm doing this stuff, and I'm starting to heal because I'm reinforcing what's working. And then my spirit made a diligent search. This is going to be hard because there is at least one question here. 
Will Yahweh spurn forever and never again be favorable? Can you imagine having that? Your chosen nation, Abraham, an ancestor of yours, has been promised, wow, and you get stuck in this dump in Babylon under a whole bunch of other people who just want to use you all the time. And you have to ask that question, it, it, have we really lost it? It is, it's hard unless, and here's where our background in faith becomes important, it's hard unless we already know the answer. But you see what's going on here? These people already know the answer. And so it's going to, asking the question is going to have a different impact on them as a result. The question that you see in verse 7 is among the, earth, the issues that worshipers must go through and not avoid, not go around. Asking questions like this is a part of the practical application, I think. But it forces believers to seriously stake the cl and claim God's character as being certain and as being dependable. If in the past sometime, God had ever said, I'm going to take care of this and hadn't done so, then you'd have an issue. But that is not what's going on, and you never see that in the history of God recorded in the Bible. And so you can assume an answer because you know what God has done in the past. Has he ever left anyone mid-jump without helping? Well, if not, then he won't do that with you either. Now, I proposed at the very beginning that there was at least one question in this process. But the truth is there are some more. As though God wants the process to be continued. Has steadfast love, and you notice there the Hebrew is the kassid, has God's covenant-based love forever ceased? Are his promises at an end for all time? So the question is important. It's simply being repeated enough to emphasize that. Many questions with answers that reinforce awareness of God's faithfulness provide for an escalating level of breakthrough see what's happening you ask the question you come up with your answer and then God says okay I want you to ask the question again same answer and you keep doing that repeatedly choosing to step into the question rather than avoid it because when you step into the question, you get an answer. God can be trusted. You don't get that answer unless you step into the question. The set of questions that are in this section of Psalm 77 are relevant back then, today with COVID, and tomorrow when we have who knows what. If you and I ever want to pour a solid foundation these are the issues we have to settle. And I think this is a very practical psalm in a time of COVID for that reason. But there are more questions. Has God forgotten to be gracious? Has he in anger shut up his compassion? Let's pause and think about it. That's the Selah. So what are the worshipers invited to realize? How critical here it is to remember God's covenant and God's character. And you know, I just recycle the stuff I said before, but that's what Psalm, the psalm does. So it's important for us to pick up that pattern. Very often what changes us, what actually makes us different, is in the form of conclusions that we have already known, that we've already spoken to one another, but that we need to reaffirm within each individual crisis. Let me give you a silly example. 
I do not know if I am odd or just like you in this. Sometime you can tell me. But I know if I'm into a project and I look at the time, then I can respond to that. But if I then turn and get started on another project, I don't remember what time it is. And I have to remember the time relative to that new project or that new thing that I'm giving attention because my answer of what time is, it doesn't always generalize. In other words, I need to carry information that's been available all along, but I need to carry it into each and every new circumstance. And that's what's happening here. That's why you get all those questions. And again, you have that sila, time to let the questions and the answers that produce the resurrection of our hearts set in. So this isn't just to realize how awful it is. This seal is to say, and because of the answers that he's given to me over time, I'm here instead of where I was. And here's where we flip away from it. The ESV, I, from here on in, I think the NIV is a perfectly fine translation. It, it is otherwise, I just thought it was more helpful to give it to you the way I did. Now I realize we're not talking about Hebrews 4, but I wanted to take a concept out of that. And it is in the writing at the top of the item. Let us therefore come bold, boldly to the throne of grace. You talk about what these guys are doing when they're doing Psalm 77 or any of the others. There is a boldness that's there, and that's, that's what makes it work. Boldness of the kind that God wants comes when we realize that the one that we know, the one that we love but cannot see, actually supports our lives, thank you very much, is never absent, is never going to let us flop. It, we have a faithful God. That one has provided us with credentials to be with him. Yeah, I'm a child of God in Jesus. Jesus is today talking with the Heavenly Father about me. He has authorization to be there. He has given me the authorization to be there. Isn't that incredible? Discouragement at that point becomes not a viable operation if you if you really want to be truthful about it. What I'm suggesting is that we are to be bold based on who our God is. That's what everything that's gone before has led up to. The crying has caused us to do things that require, you have to have somebody listening to the crying. And I'm saying it to God just the way that I feel it because I have the credentials to do that. That's the summary so far of the psalm. Now, I'm assuming that most of us have played this game, that most of us have done this sort of thing. I'm assuming that the photograph is tilted a little bit to make it so that you have attention in seeing the picture. But if life is tenacious, if, and, and if the, ex, the existing supports, uh, supports become threatened, then it's critical that we pick the places that we don't have to have, that we really do need to have support, and that we identify them and make sure we keep that particular set of things. If there's anything that we don't absolutely need, and we know we're going to lose something, we choose to keep the thing that we need. The focus, I think, in that, in the section of scripture that I'm going to read to you in just a moment, is, and in the picture is, 
I have to overcome the effect that this situation, this threat, this feeling is having in my life. And keeping the prime supports is a critical part of that. So now, reading the translation that we all have in front of us, or that those who have the NIV have in front of us, let's talk about how that comes out in Scripture. Then I thought to this I will appeal the years when the Most High stretched out his right hand I will remember the deeds of the Lord. Yes, I will remember your miracles of long ago. I will consider all your works and meditate on all your mighty deeds. Did you notice a phrase that came up a lot and that I emphasized? I will. I will. Whatever is going to be the solution in this case, is we have to keep an awareness that the I will is an important part of the equation. It's not simply that God says, oh, just, just relax, cool your jets. There is an I will component in this. It, the I will is not what makes the difference, but the I will is necessary. The Lord is going to make the difference, and we'll pick that up in the last part of this section, starting in verse 13. Your ways, God, are holy. What God is as great as our God? And so this, the praise hymn that we sang today fits. You are the God who performs miracles. You display your power among the peoples. With your mighty arm, you redeemed your people, the descendants of Jacob. So you have that partnership, don't you? goes from, I will, I'm a believer, I will, but the way I expect it to actually be treated is that you will, talking to God. And I think that's an important thing to notice all along the way. And then after that tension of working to sort out the things that you absolutely need, that, that combination of I will, you will, then there is this pause, the sila, there's a, there is another one there, so that worshipers can feel the relief as they are reviewing what God is plugging into the equation. Now, in just a moment, we're going to see a time when the remembering that he said to do, he does what he says. And he's going to be picking up a number of descriptions of Exodus of the time at Mount Sinai. It's kind of a blend, an odd blend of the time at Mount Sinai and the time when they're crossing the Red Sea. And it throws in some stuff that we don't have any way of knowing in other sources. So exactly how much of this Asaph put in for effect, I don't know. But it's, it, it's something that's, whatever reason caused him to put it in, it's something that he did put in, and it's something that's important for us to at least understand why he would do something like that. But I want us to know, before we get into those last things, that anything that produces, I am trusting you, God, anything that has that outcome, enhances our prayer. By the way... I think there's another way to see that picture than the way that, if you're like me, you've been doing right along. And it took me a while. I made several adjustments to this message over the last couple of weeks. I run with it every morning. And, made, and finally I noticed, I've assumed that that hand is taking out one more of those blocks. Did you assume that? Well, with the masks, I can't get your answers, but it is a possible thing that we could reverse and that we might be able to see at this point God putting the pieces back together again and providing a stability that had been compromised for a time. And when the people have needed to go through a hard time and God finally puts things back together again, he's the one 
who very carefully reassembles. Because with the mess that we have around us right now, it's going to take a God reassembly to make it right. Okay, now, verses 16 through 20 are the climax of this psalm. And I hope that as I read it, I can make it sound that way to you. And again, this is a kind of a mixed together description from sources that we don't have otherwise in the Bible. So they had to come either through the mind of Asaph or through extra biblical sources. The waters saw you, God. The waters saw you and writhed. The very depths were convulsed. Something like this would be accurate when you have waters that are suddenly opening a pathway for two million people and stacking up. I mean, there's a sense of, boy, it would take God doing a whole lot of stuff to make that happen. That's really what you're seeing in that psalm. The clouds poured down water. The heavens resounded with thunder. Your arrows flashed back and forth. That would be lightning. Your thunder was heard in the whirlwind. Maybe that's part of the experience on Mount Sinai. Your lightning lit up the world. The earth trembled and quaked. We know that's a part of the Mount Sinai experience. Your path led through the sea. Your way through the mighty waters. Through your, even though your footprints were not seen. It's an interesting way of saying that, isn't it? You led your people like a flock by the hand of Moses and Aaron. In other words, a flock has somebody who's taking care of them, doesn't it? Whether it's God's instruments or God himself, it's, that's what a flock does. You know, sometimes the solution to the problems that we face in life is the same old, same old stuff. Psalm 77 is a prayer that is designed to meet the believer's needs as the believers give access to God. Making God central in prayer is absolutely vital throughout serious, individual, or shared pain. If he isn't in the middle of it, if you are the central figure in what you are praying, or somebody else that you want to lift up before God becomes the central point, then it's out of kilter and it won't work as well. Asaph's hurting nation used Psalm 77 to rehearse and to retain the stuff that it already knew. This isn't new information. Even this powerful example is the old, old story one more time. And then you have people who are going to go to wherever they go after the worship experience and repeat it and use it to build themselves up. What you just heard is the stuff that they must have taken home to share. God wants to be sought persistently. We can tell that out of the psalm, can't we? That's one of the builder's pieces. God will not ever forget the covenant. God is dependably merciful. God wants our remembering, especially powerful stuff that he does. He wants our trust. God wants our jumping into his care before the bridge is actually completed. So I advise all of us, me, you, whosoever, pray. Tell Yahweh that you know and believe and that you are committed to trusting him. Because God responds as no other can. God has a history. God has a known character as a redeemer. And God has proven to be the good shepherd. In order to succeed in making the time of worship work, form a prayer around the elements that you see that became central when Asaph was writing the prayer. I mean, you don't have to be super clever and come up with your own. It, it, sometimes that helps. But here you have it provided for you. Just notice what he's put into it and say, Amen. 
I, I agree with that stuff. You know, before Cheryl passed, I stood in front of you and I said, I think she's going to make it. I was obviously wrong. But I also stood before you and said, if she does not make it, I will tell you now, i.e. before she passed, I will tell you what my level of trust is going to be in the Lord. I committed before you as I committed before the Lord. This is not going to shake me if I lose her. And I really think that what's going on in Psalm 77 is basically the same dynamic. Every one of us needs to have made the commitment, I don't care what you put into the life around me. I have the commitment. I have established that commitment. And Lord, because you have drawn me with a whole set of information and a presence that is undeniable, I am going to make the commitment before I need it. And I think if we ever leave that issue unsettled, then, then we lose something along the way. I, I don't predict catastrophe or anything like that. But it's been very helpful to me to have already said before the issue came to a head for me, I've already made up my mind. And I have really been very surprised personally that I haven't been devastated before God in terms of faith by losing her. But you know, I've never felt that way because making that decision beforehand has allowed me to go into this and through it with that part settled. And I just haven't had to fight that battle. 77 says do that on a regular basis. Would you pray with me please? Father, you love us. Wow. <laughs> yeah. And, and some of us have been the sinners who caused a judgment, and others of us have been innocent bystanders who've been caught up in the COVID or anything else. And, and yet, the truth is that even when we're in that position, you have us covered. We say thank you. And we praise you, and we say, help us to claim what's really ours already. In the name of Jesus Christ, amen. Eric will come in just a moment. We'll do our typical ending. I do remind you, you have a bulletin. If you have picked it up, if you've touched it, please take it home so that those who clean up here don't have to take care of it for you. Eric, would you please lead us? Amen. Please stand.
care of her.